the past, the present, and the future. Do you know what time it is? You might be surprised to find out. Stay tuned. Today I'm going to talk about why it matters when it comes to what you believe concerning the end times. You know, I I have dealt with this topic matter for 20, 20 plus years, and in uh, my journeys and my studies, I've definitely come out of a lot to come into. And make no mistake about it, ladies and gentlemen, in order to come into where the Lord uh, wants to bring you, in other words, in order to have right revelation, um, clear understanding when it comes to the study of eschatology, the study of end times, then it's very, very, very important that you allow the Lord to bring you out in order to come in. It's just like um, moving from one room to the next room when it comes to you have to go through transition. In other words, you have to go, th you got to come out in order to come in. Now, this is even when it comes to the kingdom. That's why metanoia, repentance, when it comes to kingdom initiation, when you are born again, when you get saved for real, you have to come out to come in. You you can't stay in the kingdom of darkness and be in the kingdom of God at the same time. You just can't. That's the reason why there's a pattern that was established in Acts chapter 2 when after Peter preached, after he took a stand with the eleven, and the men said, after he preached, what should we do? What can we do to be saved? And Peter says, repent, get baptized, and receive the Holy Spirit. So it's really important to understand then that it is about dynamiting or being dynamited. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. The word power is a Greek word that we call dunamis. Dunamis is where we derive the English word dynamite. So when Peter says, you will, when Jesus said you will receive power, they received that power and that power was the apostolic preaching of the gospel, not just speaking in tongues and prophesying. You know, these are parts. These are manifestations of the Holy Spirit. But the emphasis in Acts 2 is the power to preach the gospel that brought forth men to an understanding of their awareness of their of their fallen fallenness, their their humanness, their sinfulness, that they had to be born again, or in other words, in order to be saved from the perverse generation that Peter's talking about in Acts chapter two, they had to repent. Repentance then leads to baptism. Baptism then leads to receiving the Holy Spirit. When you receive the Holy Spirit, you have been added to the Lord's general church. And then the Lord places you in family, spiritual family, with uh, with authentic pastoral care or apostolic oversight, a true, a true elder of the Lord's church. And there you grow up in all things pertaining to the head, being Christ Jesus. So even when it comes to... Um, your first, the first time you were aware that you needed a Savior and His name was Jesus, you had to come out to go in. And there was a pattern set up to, sh to show us how to do it. It's not on um, the Romans road. You believe, I'm just going to feel sorry for my sins. I'm going to believe in my heart, confess with my mouth that the Lord's... Listen, there is truth to that, but it's not the validity of kingdom initiation or how you come out of one government into the next government, how you are translated out of darkness into light. The same thing comes with all of the truth that we hold in the Scripture, which means that there are many things that we have been taught and even indoctrinated within our spiritual upbringing that has taught us something Concerning the end of times, the last days, um, the, the the rapture of the church, the second coming of Jesus, the great tribulation, the Antichrist, the beast of Revelation, the beast of Daniel, um, the final resurrection. All of these things pertain to what we coin in theology as eschatology. Eschatology simply defined means the study of final things or the study of last things. Things. It's a study of the end of something. Eschatology then has its roots anchored in the revelation or understanding that 
when we look at something that pertains to that which is last, there's an eschatology in your own personal life. The day you are born, the day that you go on into glory to be with the Lord, that is your eschatology. But the eschatology, of course, that I'm talking about right now is the eschatology of King Jesus and those 12 apostles. I want to say that again. The eschatology that I'm going to be talking about is the eschatology of King Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, and those original 12 apostles. And I'm going to show you some powerful key scriptures and key words in the Gospel of St. Matthew chapter 24 that will bring a lot of clarity to the present subnormality and confusion that we find today in our many, many congregations or what we call churches. Now it's imperative that we get a handle on this because ladies and gentlemen, I need to make a statement right now and that statement is this, eschatology is not a side issue. I'm going to say that again. Eschatology is not a side issue. The eschatology is part of the gospel. That's a bold statement, I know. I'm going to say it again, though. Eschatology is part of the gospel. And I'm going to show you why. Because if we receive half a gospel or a part of a gospel, you know, we can, we can believe Jesus Christ to be our Lord and be saved and be on our way to heaven, you know, we can we can we can have walked through that part of it but ladies and gentlemen hear me clearly it doesn't mean we've come into the fullness in order for us to become everything that we have been designed by God to be in this earth if we're going to be the vessels of God or the instruments of righteousness or the instruments of threshing in the nations for a harvest then we've got to have clarity when it comes to the full gospel of the kingdom. I, first thing you must understand here, and I'm laying a little bit of groundwork, is that the word kingdom is not a side issue either. You know, I grew up in the Pentecostal streams of churches, and I heard a lot about um, salvation. I heard a lot about come to the cross and get saved, as we understand and recognize that that is the beginning. See, keep in mind that even our salvation, the entrance of salvation, the place where we have been regenerated, where we have been saved, we are being saved, we're going to be saved, all of this um, begins in a man, the God-man, the Theanthropos, Jesus the Messiah. So Jesus then is protology. Now, I ask you to, to stay with me. I know not everybody wants to go deep. Come on, let's just go a little deeper today and let's get into the depths of some of these scriptures. So Jesus Christ is perfect theology. He is the express image of the Father. He is the per perfect representation of God the Father, and he is the prototype man of the whole brand new creation of God. So Jesus is the proton. He is the first. Protology comes from the f study of first things. Eschatology is a study of last things. So when we say that Jesus is the first and the last, then we say that protology and eschatology is not an event, but but protology and eschatology is a person. So Christ is the proton and he is the eschaton, the first and the last, which means the beginning of salvation starts with him and the ending of salvation ends in him. There is no salvation outside of him. He's the beginning, the end, the first, the last, the proton, the eschaton. So when we study about eschatology, we must keep our end time view in alignment with Christology, which means that any eschatology that you presently hold or any of your end time beliefs that you adhere to, that you hold on to, that is anchored in any other being or entity outside of Jesus the Messiah, then your eschatology already is, fla is fatally flawed, completely, fatally flawed. It is, it is already it is a eschatology built on something other than the substance of the text because the text is clear that even in the book of the revelation it is not the revelation of the antichrist the revelation of the beast the revelation of a rebuilt roman empire somewhere in the 
indeterminate future off in the sweet by and by, always living in a state of suspended animation, waiting that one day Jesus is going to rapture us. Hallelujah. Let me get raptured upside down so that I can stick my tongue out at the devil. We have to dismantle the error today in order for us to become the church of the living God that the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. The, the preacher is on me this morning already, and I am I am attempting to teach, but you know we must have the authenticity of valid, the validity of truth that is going to give us the substance, the foundation, and the boundaries in which the kingdom of God will fill all things ultimately that the glory of God can cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. So understanding that eschatology is not about the Antichrist or the beast of Rome or the beast of a new Rome or whatever we think it is. It's not about the side issues. The issue at hand is understanding the main thing and keeping the main thing the main thing who is the preeminent one of all creation, the protology who is also, also the eschatology and his name is Jesus. So when we turn to Revelation chapter 1, the very opening teaches us that this is the revelation of Jesus the Christ. This is the Revelation. The word revelation is the Greek word apocalypto, where we understand or we hear many times the word apocalypse. So we think the apocalypse is coming. Good. Let it let the apocalypse come. Because the apocalypse is not a negative. The apocalypse is a pro, a positive. It is it is life. It is vitality. The apocalypse is the unveiling, the revealing of the Messiah. So the apocalypse or apocalypto means unveiling or revealing who Jesus is. Jesus really is. So there is no authentic unveiling of the Christ until you get to the book of Revelation. That's the reason why we have a lot of people today that they live their lives strictly from the perspective of the four Gospels. And there is an issue here because though that is the authenticity of Christ, his mission, there's a harmony of the Gospels. All of the things that Jesus did couldn't even be contained in the books of the world. But yet we see an ultimate unveiling. Uh, as John, who is the beloved, you know, the same one who wrote the Gospel of John, the one who wrote First John and Second John and Third John, though some liberal theologians would try to attribute those works to someone else, I still believe that is Saint John. I believe it's Saint John, and he's also the one who wrote the Book of Revelation, which was during a period of time that he had been persecuted. Some, um, some, some, some. Um, accounts, historical accounts would say that they tried to kill John, couldn't kill him. They tried to boil him in oil. He wouldn't die, so they vanished him to the island of Patmos, and that it was on the Lord's day that the risen Christ reveals himself to John through a series of of accounts that we find of the unfolding of the worship service that's going on in heaven, which is not like a worship service like we think today. So it is an opening into what's going on on the Lord's Day, which is, which is besides day, it's an ongoing day, but it is an extension or an opening or an unveiling to us to be able to see what it looks like when the church together ascends Zion on the Lord's Day, on, on our Sunday morning services when we go, and I know Sunday has its own, but listen, for the, for the sake of staying in context, I'm not going to deal with Gregorian calendars or what they mean. The fact is, is that when Jesus rose from the dead, it was the first day of the week. John, on the first day of the week on the island of Patmos, has the unveiling, and he is ushered into a throne room worship service to be able to see how judgment is executed upon nations and the paradigm of how or the pattern of how the Lord deals with nations even today. So going into Matthew chapter 24 then we are going to pick up and realize that Matthew 24 was written to a specific group of people and it is an exegetical fallacy to try to make it say something other than what it is saying in its plain text. When we look at the plain text of Matthew chapter 24 and even just do a 5, 10, 15 minutes worth of word study in the Greek text, you're going to find out there are certain words that are contributed or attributed here um, that is giving us clear indications to exactly who Jesus was talking to when he was referring to the things that were going to take place 
in that time period. Matthew chapter 24, we're going to pick up in verse 1, and we're going to unfold or help to unveil some of the revelation or the mysteries of eschatology. And here, hear me, hear me well. We must understand the eschatology of the kingdom. If we do not, we will invent or create our own, as many have done many, many times before. So it is not a side issue because, watch this, outside of understanding the eschatology of Jesus, you will never know what time it is. You will never know where you are at in the unfolding of God's eternal purpose. You may have inclinations, you may sense certain things are on the horizon, but how do you know something to be um, indicative? How do you know something to be, um, when it comes to truth, how are you to know that what we're looking at is an absolute, today when we look at things around, how do we really know that it is um what we call objective truth. Because outside of having the right eschatology, even when you sense things by the Holy Spirit, it is subjective because you don't have the objective truth to be able to give you the foundation in which to build the spiritual insight that you might be gleaning from the Holy Spirit. And oftentimes you're going to find out if you're anything like me, when I was coming out to come in, let me say that again, when I was in the process of coming out to come in to a uh, a deeper understanding of the eschatology of the kingdom, um, there were a lot of things that I would get in prophetic ministry that did not line up at all with the teachings that I was hearing. It's kind of like this. We're at church and somebody calls you out and they've got a strong prophetic grace on their life and they call you out and they say, Yay, I say unto thee, one door shall close and then another door shall open and you will go to the nations and God will use you to cease signs and wonders, and many people will be saved if the Lord tarries. See how they would tag at the end of the prophecy, if the Lord tarries, as if God has no freaking clue to what time it is himself, and he's going to give you all these great promises, but the promises are, of course, contingent upon rather or not he decides to rapture his church between now and then. Do you see the, the psychological issues in that statement alone? God is not confused about what time it is, and neither were his apostles, and neither was Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry when he begins to talk to the disciples in Matthew's Gospel of chapter 24. Now let's look at verse 1. Chapter 24, verse 1. It says, and interesting in, in, in this um, Bible I'm using right here, in the subtitle itself, it actually says that the destruction of the temple predicted. It actually says the destruction of the temple predicted, uh, which is kind of profound. So let's look at verse 1. As Jesus left and was going out of the temple. So now Jesus is leaving the temple that was existing, the place where animal sacrifices were still being offered, where we had what we understood as a outer court, an inner court and a holy of holies. It was a, it was Herod's temple. Um, so we understand this was the this was the during the um, during the different period of time where the where Herod's temple had been erected and and this was the place of worship and sacrifice that the Jews gathered and they brought forth um, their animal sacrifices, their grain offerings, places where they brought burnt offerings on the brazen altar, the, the brazen laver. Then you know in in the holy place you had the table showbread, the the, the menorah or the golden lampstand, and then you. You had the, the the veil, and before the veil, you had the altar of incense, and then once a year on the Day of Atonement, they would take the incense, and they would slide it up under the veil that the, the incense would, would rise, uh, which which deals with the deals with the covering, the presence being sanctified and covered in prayer and worship and adoration, and you walk in once a year to offer the sacrifice on the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant. This was still existing, and I, and I know this seems to be obvious, but obviously this was still existing during the times of Jesus. They were still making the sacrifices. They were still under the Old Covenant paradigm and the Old Covenant priestly system. So when Jesus walked the earth and he was calling his apostles, he was in the process, watch this, he was in the process of making all things brand new. But in order to bring a full 
um, a full a full beginning of what's new he had to first bring an end to what was presently existing so in other words it's just like being born again let's look at how god dealt with men in for for briefly a brief moment let's talk about how god dealt with people throughout the previous covenants of the Old Testament. Now, when we look back, we see there's really only one covenant that existed within a nation or nationality, which was the law of Moses, the covenant of Israel, the old covenant. But there were what we call dispensations. Now, don't get this confused with dispensationalism because this will get us off track. There are really three specific dispensations that we find throughout the scriptures. The first one was um, how God dealt with the patriarchs, he, how he dealt with Abraham, how he dealt with Isaac and Jacob, how he dealt with uh, the people before Noah, Enoch, etc. This is how God dealt in that dispensational he was a it was what we call a patriarch dispensation so God dealt with people not by means of judging or dealing with nations rather that during that period of time that God dealt with his people as individuals or heads of households or families so he would deal with the head of a household being say the father of that house and then that father would be uh, was that father was expected by the Lord to live and deal with his household in a godly way. So God dealt with, in the, in the dispensation of the patriarchs, God dealt with mankind by means of heads of households individually. But by the time Moses comes on the scene and evacuates Israel from the iron hand of the Pharaoh and ultimately gets them into the wilderness on that 40-year period that should have only taken 11 days to cross the promised land, during that period of time, God begins to set up the Old Covenant. He says that what it, was, it was the New Covenant to them, but the Old Covenant for us. So the covenant that God made with Moses, Moses being the mediator of the Old Covenant, or the high priest, I know Aaron was the priest, but the high priest between God and man, he was the mediator of the Old Covenant, and that Old Covenant brought forth a law, and that law was how God would deal with that nation in light of a, a, um, a plurality or a pluralistic, uh, a pluralistic community. So now you have families, heads of households, but now you also have heads of tribes, and you have um, heads of, of, of heads of the entire nation. So ultimately now, God is dealing with the nations based upon the leadership that's established. That's the second, watch this, the second dispensation. But moving into the third and final dispensation comes from when King Jesus makes all things new, but there is what we understand then, ladies and gentlemen, is a transitional time coming from the end of the old and the beginning of the new, there is an overlap. Watch me now, which means that when something new begins, usually there's something old that's still in operation, that's still working. So in order to bring a full end to the old, we have to begin to move forward into the new. And so the cross was the centrality that brought in division between the old and the new, but yet there is still an overlapping. So even after the cross, Old Testament or the Old Covenant Israel, the Jews, were still practicing animal sacrifice and temple worship in the Old Covenant temple or on the temple mound. So even though Jesus Christ has now become the sacrifice of sin for all nations, all who believe, both Jew and Gentile, bond or free, male or female, nonetheless, they were still offering animal sacrifice and they were not they were not accepting or receiving or believing in the eternal sacrifice of the eternally begotten son of god jesus to christ so Jesus is about to pick up near the end of his ministry, his earthly ministry, and he's about to pick up here in Matthew chapter 24 and bring some clarity to even though as he was beginning to build a whole new creation, starting with those 12, that he was going to bring some clarity to what had to happen in order to bring a full end to the old covenant and in order to bring forth 
the dawning of Messiah's day, the day of the Lord, which is the inauguration of his eternal kingdom that knows no end. So let's look at this in Matthew chapter 24 as we pick up. So, as Jesus left and was going out of the temple, his disciples came up and called his attention to his buildings. Listen to what's going on. They come out of the temple mound, and the disciples came up and called his attention, Jesus' attention, to the buildings out there. Jesus replied to them, Do you see all these things? Truly I tell you, not one stone will be left here on another that will not be thrown down. The prophecy just comes out of Jesus' mouth that concerning the temple mount and all of the buildings attached to the temple, the place of animal sacrifice and old covenant mosaic worship would come to a complete end. He said, look, this is all going to happen. It's all going to come down. Now, something you need to understand concerning the temple mount, that in ancient Near Eastern culture, so this isn't just um, the way that Israel believed, old Israel believed, but this is the way that the surrounding nations, uh, ancient Near East, the way they believed, the way they worshipped, is that the place where the temple was established, the place where the temple was built, of course, was the place where they worshipped their deity, their the, their entity, their god. So when a, when a nation or a group of people or a tribe or whatever, they would build their temple, and their temple was their place to worship. Now, what made the temple so important in the eyes of the ancient Near Eastern culture that they didn't worship at home? But rather, they would go, they'd worship in the temple because in the minds of these people, the temple was the place where heaven and earth joined together into a oneness or to a, or to a blend or a one. It was where heaven and earth comes into each other. It's where heaven and earth interlocks. So in order to experience heaven while you're still breathing on this planet, you had to go into the temple, and going into the place of the temple is bringing you into the presence of God. We see this in typology and shadow when God comes down on the mountain. Moses enters into the dark clouds, into the unknowing, transcendent God at that time, and Israel stays down at the base of the mountain because they were afraid they would die, but nonetheless, the base of the mountain deals with the outer court, but Moses is going to go into the thick darkness because he is the mediator of heaven and earth. He mediates heaven to earth with the people of the earth. So the temple is the place where heaven and earth comes together as one in order for there to be a mediation with a priesthood between a God and a human so that God can minister to the human and the human can minister to God and the priesthood was the mediator that would would worship and and do the services and the and the temple rites of practice within the temple itself because they mediated. So the priesthood then was a group of people that were anointed, set aside, set apart from secular earthly labor and earthly ministry because they were given to the portion of God himself and they brought forth the revelation, the oracle, the, um, the, the reconciliation, the the redemption, the atonement for sin. So this is what we understand when Jesus is standing on the Temple Mount and the disciples walk up to him and say, look at this. Isn't this where heaven and earth comes together? Isn't this the place where God meets with his, his humans, where God meets with mankind? Isn't this the place where we can step into divine providence and receive our daily bread, our provision, the revelation, our instruction? Isn't this the place? And Jesus says, look at it. I want you to take a good look at this temple right now. Do you see it? Every single stone that has been put together by mortar, every brick is going to be ripped to pieces and it's going to be thrown down. Now let's back up a moment and look at John chapter 4. Jesus must go to Samaria. This is so important. You know, when we look at the woman at the well, St. Fotini is her name in, in historical church history, and this is a woman of God who was so powerful that ultimately, ultimately in, in, in near the end of her life, Nero Caesar had her thrown into a well, a dry well, and according to historical documents and legend, people would gather 
gathered around that well as she would sing new songs before her death and they would write them down and people were getting healed and miracles were happening happening at the well where St. Fatini had been. But St. Fatini at that point didn't know who Jesus was. She was a Samaritan who didn't understand the reason why the Jews would worship in the temple and the Samaritans would worship on the mountain. The mountain with the high places is where they thought it was an elevated place where heaven could meet earth once again. And Jesus says to this woman at the well, I tell you the hour cometh and now is that your that our ancestors or, or that the people of God will not worship on the mountain or the temple, but the hour comes and now is that the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. How do you worship in spirit and in truth? How do you become a temple of God's presence, His eternal indwelling of the Holy Spirit revealing Christ in us? How does this even happen if there is an existing temple of worship that is in the name of Yahweh? So in order for us us to become the lively stones fitted together to make up the temple of the Holy Spirit, the new meeting place of heaven and earth, then the old existing must come down because it is still an order that is existing. So legally on the cross, Jesus deals with it, separates the old from the new, the old creation and the new creation, the old heavens, the new heavens, the old earth, the new earth, old covenant, new covenant, but Yet illegally in operation for another 40 years, there is a temple that is offering up animal sacrifice, which is an abomination of desolation against Almighty God. Because once the presence of God has been brought into our lives, and we understand that there is no other sacrifice than the sacrifice that was made once and for all through Jesus Christ's precious blood, then to offer up another sacrifice in order to atone for sin sin is antichrist fully completely it is in abomination even though there were roman emperors and leaders that set up statues in the temple which some would say was the abomination of desolation my heart tells me the true abomination of desolation is the moment they slaughtered a goat or they slaughtered a lamb after jesus christ had already paid the ultimate price so jesus says this heaven and earth must be torn to pieces this temple when i say heaven and earth always keep in mind i'm talking about the temple heaven and earth conjoined is always dealing with temple theology it is always dealing with temple worship again because the temple is the place where heaven and earth comes together in one and this hasn't changed ladies and gentlemen so you must understand that in the old testament the moment that the tabernacle of moses was finished everything was in place and the sacrifice was made the fire fell upon the altar supernaturally and the cloud of god descended upon the ark of the covenant and the glory was present to old testament israel and he led them through the wilderness by a cloud by day in a pillar of fire by night. Too many people on a side note here chasing this rabbit down this trail are still looking for a cloud by day and a fire by night. God once again lead us by a cloud by day. Listen, the cloud was to keep them cool from the hot sun during the daytime and the fire was to keep them warm at night and give them light to be able to see if the enemy was to come. We don't need a cloud by day and a fire by night because we're not building a human temple built out of material substance. Because when Jesus comes on the scene, this is better, and I'm not patting myself on the shoulder really, but I'll give myself an amen. This is better than what I'm getting right now as far as the feed and the live and the people what people watching. But nonetheless, I know there will be others picking up on this in another time. When Jesus comes into the earth, this is where we understand in Christology. The, uh, this is going to take me a few days to, to teach this Matthew 24. So I'm going to I'm going to finish up on, on this temple idea, and then when I get done, we're going to close this for the day and I'm going to pick back up into the sign of the coming and I'm going to get into some of these words because this stuff is so rich and I don't want to rush through it all so give me about another 10-15 minutes I'm going to finish this up so when Jesus, this is Christology, the incarnation is that when Jesus comes into the earth it is God wrapped in human flesh the anthropos or then we call what we call hypostatic union, he is 100% God, 100% man uh, Jesus walks into earth for his earthly ministry when he's 30 years old. He finds the river in Jordan. John's baptizing people into repentance. Jesus steps down into the water, and John baptizes him. The Holy Spirit descends from heaven as a dove and remains upon the Lamb of God. This is important. 
Because Jesus was given the Spirit of God without measure. Now remember, in the Old Testament, the Spirit and presence of God abided upon the temple. Now what we understand is that the Holy Spirit in visible manifestation when dealing with Old Covenant Israel is not in two places at one time. Typically, that, not, not that what I see. Of course, God's omnipresent. Of course, He can do whatever He, want, he wants to do. But typically, from, from what I perceive, and if I'm wrong about this, I'll search this out a little bit more, but I think I'm correct here, is that in the Old Testament, we don't see the presence of God coming on, um, descending upon the congregation of, of Moses in the temple, but yet then coming down on another temple. See, now I'm not talking about individual people here. I'm talking about temples. So Jesus Christ is the new temple of the new creation. He's the firstborn among many temples or the firstborn among many brethren. So when Jesus receives the Holy Spirit, this is the presence of God or the glory of God descending upon the new temple in which all other temples or Lively stones, which make up one temple, is really what I'm trying to say here. That ultimately, that we, he's the chief cornerstone of that temple. Hear me, Jesus is the chief cornerstone. The foundation is the doctrine of the apostles. Jesus is the chief cornerstone of that foundation, and the temple of God is built up, which carries the presence and glory of God. So when the Holy Spirit comes down on Jesus in Matthew 4 and Luke 4, and I believe Mark 1, if I'm not mistaken, then what we find here is that the presence of God obviously has left. Ichabod had been written on the temple of Jerusalem. The temple, uh, the temple that Jesus is talking about in Matthew 24 is a temple that doesn't have glory. It is a temple that is void of the glory in the presence of God. So when the Holy Spirit descends on Jesus, he doesn't come from the temple of the Jesus. The glory of God had already departed from the temple of Israel. Now the glory of God is on Jesus, and he is filled with the Holy Spirit without measure. So Jesus is the new temple. That temple now is becoming obsolete. So Jesus spends the next three and a half years pouring into the twelve, getting them ready to become, watch this, the foundational stones for a whole new temple which will bring forth the light and the glory of God to the nations. So you don't have God's glory to nations. You don't have God's presence to nations outside of the temple. So this, this is imperative to new creation reality. Without this understanding, we are incomplete in our eschatology, we are incomplete in our theology, and we are truly incomplete in our Christology. Because outside of understanding that Christ is the cornerstone of a new temple, then we're never going to have the glory and the presence of God abiding within us is in a corporate setting. Because what we can't get done today dealing with principalities and powers by ourselves, when the temple corporately has been built together in one holy apostolic church, then watch this, ladies and gentlemen. The blind will see, the dead will be raised, ears open. I don't mean just here, and I'm talking about Boom! Spiritual blindness, spiritual deafness, physical blindness, physical deafness. You want to see cancer healed? Then the church must become one. Because one unified body built up of lively stones making up the temple of God, the new Jerusalem of God that comes down from God out of heaven. Jesus, it is the Lamb's wife. And because we begin to recognize the reality of this revelation, that we have to shift our attention from what we do as individuals, as my personal ministry, hallelujah, you don't have a personal ministry, you do not have a personal singular ministry, you don't, you may think you do, and you might, but it's not God's, because there's only one ministry in the new, one, uno, 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 one, singular, there's only one one ministry in the New Testament, period. Apollo, we got fivefold ministry, apostle, prophet, they are all they are all extensions of one singular ministry. It is the ongoing ministry of Jesus. Acts chapter one, carefully, faithfully read it, you'll find out concerning the ministry of Judas. It was a shared ministry with the eleven. The apostolate is an is the what apostolate is, is the fellowship of all apostles. So those twelve apostles minus Judas plus Matthias, they make up one apostolic ministry, and it is the ministry of our is the ministry of Jesus Christ, who is our apostle. He is our high priest, and he's the apostle 
or our faith, building a brand new creation. But in order to build a brand new creation, like I said, the old had to be removed completely and permanently, and we don't see that in the first uh, in in the first event of King Jesus. We don't see the removal of the old, but we find the prophecy of King Jesus. I'm I'm going to go into it just for a few moments. I'm, I might as well just for a few minutes. I'm gonna I'm gonna begin to open this up just a little bit. So Jesus is saying to the temple, remember, the temple is heaven and earth, where heaven and earth meet. Now, just a side note quickly, we're going to read verse 34, and then we're going to go back to verse 1, and then I'll probably pick back up on this on another day, because I do not, I want to give, I want to give this enough time. So when we look at verse uh, 35, it says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Now, of course, in our dispensational, premillennial indoctrination of the era of church eschatology that we've had over the last 150 years, we'll say, heaven and earth is going to pass away, brother. It's going to burn with fervent heat. We're going to fry like bacon. Bless God, hallelujah, but it's all right. I'm going to get out of here in the rapture. That is such a Western teaching. When we have more martyrs today, hear me now, we've got more martyrs today than we've ever had in any time of history. We don't hold to account that our brothers in China and our brothers in the Middle East and our brothers in India, our brothers in, in, in deep, dark jungles are dying for the gospel. They are bearing faithful martyrion or the faithful witness of the testimony of Jesus Christ. But yet because we are in the West, we think, oh God... Oh, God, I don't know what I'm going to do today. I didn't have enough money to get my nails done. And listen, I'm not against getting your nails done at all. God wants us to be blessed. Of course he does. But listen, the things we call suffering and persecution is a mockery to men and women who are literally laying their lives down for the gospel. And we think that we're going to get raptured before some form of great tribulation comes. Great tribulation is a... People are going through great tribulation today. That's that whole idea of that which was, shall be, and there's no new thing under the sun. I'm not saying Matthew 24 or Revelation has multiple prophetic fulfillments because I do not believe that, obviously. But I am saying there is a spiritual application to the scriptures. And even though we must recognize that when the scriptures are not talking to us, uh, if the scriptures are not talking directly to us, they are still related to us because we're related to the body. So even though when they're not written for us, they may be written, uh, they're not written to us, they still could be written for us because we've got to learn from them. But we've got to pay attention then when we say that heaven and earth will not pass away uh, until all my words will remain. But so heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Jesus is making a clear reference here that the heaven and earth through the understanding Standing ancient Near Eastern culture, those Jews knew exactly what he was talking about. He was talking about the temple, period. He's talking about the temple, the temple on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. So in verse 2 of Matthew 24, Jesus replied to them, Do you see all these things? Truly I tell you, not one stone will be left here upon another that will not be thrown down. Verse 3, while he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples approached him privately and said, because they want to know what he's talking about. Keep in context that verse 3 here and verse 4 is a direct, um, a direct exegesis of verse 1. So they want to know, they want to know some things. Now pay attention, there are two questions, two clear questions Two clear questions that the disciples bring and present to Jesus, and then the entirety, watch this, if the entirety of Matthew 24 then is given to answer these two questions. Let me say that again. Yeah, that's what the Greek text says too. It, it, it's absolute. It, listen, this is the polemic in me that will go like a go like a pit bull after some of the false doctors day, where people are, well, brother, you gotta learn how to read the Greek, and then you read the Greek, you're see, just talking about two different. Per no, it's not because I do look at the Greek, and it doesn't say that. It is full of singular personal pronouns that identify the time of the events to that generation who was listening to Jesus talk to them. If I talk to you on the phone and I say, yeah, I'm going to come see you tonight and we're going to have a barbecue and we're going to go swimming or go fishing out by the lake. It's going to be a great time. And then I don't show up and, and you're like, well, I know Brother Shane wasn't really talking to me. He was talking about my great, 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 great grandchildren. And he's going to come back one day and go fishing with them and have a barbecue with them. That's really what he meant. 
This is stupid. I mean, I, I, I know I'm pretty livid right here about this, but you can see how passionate I am. About, I got brothers right now, brothers who I love and I respect. And they don't even think this is important. And it breaks my heart because it is a huge part of the gospel. You can't dismiss this. Because the moment you dismiss eschatology, you dismiss your participation with the Lord's holy one apostolic church in judging nations that bring forth righteous judgments when there's injustice and persecution and martyrs and it is the gospel the hope of the gospel that brings a treaty of peace to nations that say listen mr king i don't care who you think you are you can kill me but because i just bore faithful witness of the message of the kingdom you can put me to death but my death will be a seed that's been planted in the ground and if you kill me there's going to be many more like me that's going to come forth and the judgment of god will come on your nation because you are persecuting the Lord's church and you have rejected the only means of salvation that has ever come so it is imperative we understand the eschatology or you don't participate not really you may think you do and you may not like what I'm saying right now but if you want to participate in the expansion in the extension in the organic growth of the ever advancing kingdom of God in the nations then you have to understand the eschatology it's not a side issue and it's not just to give yourself a pedal back and say well we can do whatever we want to Jesus ain't coming back now we got all the time in the world it has nothing to do with that some people say well if you think he's coming back you're gonna live like you're ready if you know what you're your call to do you're going to be ready because we're not promised our next breath necessarily not in generally speaking i do believe prophetic words hold life in us and if we stay aligned with prophetic words then we won't die but we will live until we fulfill our mission but if we don't know what our mission is what's going to happen next how can we fight with prophecies over our life if we don't even know what time it is and what hour we're living in? Because, ladies and gentlemen, we're not living in the last days. We're not living in the end times at all, period. Our, it's, the Holy Spirit, expunge it from their memory. Expunge that lie out of their mind. Let them see the scriptures within the context in which it was written. Peter says, in the last days it shall come to pass, I'll pour out my spirit. So we think we can get up and preach, we're in the last days, brother, because somebody got filled with the Holy Ghost last night. Hell no, man. What are we looking at here? We're looking at that Peter knew exactly what time it was. He read Joel 2, said, this is the fulfillment of that. Then he said, and Jesus, who you crucified, has received the throne of David in his resurrection. Fulfill 2 Samuel chapter 7. We got to know what hour we're in. Even John, in his letter, 1 John, he said, Beloved, we know it is the last hour. The last hour of what? The last hour of heaven and earth, the old heaven and earth, or the old temple of Jerusalem. Some people say, well, brother, you know that John's epistle was written in 95 AD, some, uh, what, 25 years after the temple. That is not true, ladies and gentlemen. That is a, really what that is, is modern scholarship, and, 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 and listen, most modern scholars don't even believe John wrote it, and if John didn't write it, then the writer's lying. Why would he say I'm John if he's not John? Why would Paul say this is Paul if it's not Paul? Come on, guys, work with me right here. Think with me. When you have to date the scripture, you have two forms of evidence that is presented to you that gives you the ability to date the scriptures, to find out when they were written, the historical, uh, the historical date of the original scripture, the original text. And there is what we call internal evidence and external evidence. If the external evidence contradicts the internal evidence, then I'm going with the internal evidence. See, my personal... My personal stance is that the entirety of the canon closed before AD 70. John wrote this saying this last hour, the last hour of heaven, and Peter picks up the heavens and earth will burn up with fervent heat. This has indeed happened. So somebody may be listening. Well, brother, you don't believe Jesus is coming back? Said, yes. Listen, whoa, whoa, watch now. Watch now. There is a huge difference in Jesus' return in judging nations and Jesus' final appearing on the last day where he deals with death and the bodily resurrection occurs. Jesus will return on that last day in final judgment, the resurrection of the dead, rewards and judgment happens. 
That is future. But between now and then, we got to know what time it is. And in order to know what time it is, we've got to begin to allow the Holy Spirit to rewire and reroute our mind in a way that we receive information as truth and quit rejecting it because it's not what grandma and grandpa taught you. Because just because grandma and grandpa was right on some things doesn't make them right on all things. We got to go back further than grandma and grandpa. We got to go back further than John Nelson Darby those last 150 years since this strange fire has been spread across America and the, and the nations of the earth because of American missionaries. And we got to go back all the way through church history. We deal through 2,000 years of church history and we go all the way back to Jesus and those 12 apostles. And even if the second, third, and fourth century patristics and, and Cappadocian fathers may not have always seen it this way. We need to go back even before them and examine the light of the scriptures and the context of the scriptures because there and then we begin to find out how Messiah's kingdom operates today and what we must do to fellowship, cooperate, and partner with his ongoing advancing kingdom in the earth today. I'm going to read a couple more verses and I'm going to bring this to close today. Pick back up on it probably tomorrow around the same time. So what we look at here, it says, Jesus, then, so, the, the, so the disciples asked two questions. They asked Jesus two questions about his statement about the temple being destroyed. That, that temple that was existed, the place of heaven and earth, place of worship. And, uh, and they asked these two questions. And they said to the Lord, tell us, number one, when will these things happen? First question they asked Jesus, when will these things happen? And number two, what is the semion of your coming? Semion is where we get the word semiotics, or the word sign here. So profound. So I'm not, I'm not going to get into semiotics right now. Well, semiotics is the key, one of the huge keys that we find throughout the entirety of scriptures that gives us the ability to have the ability, not necessarily prophecy, but the ability to be able to observe trends and trajectories in order to know where we are based on where we've come from in order to know how to navigate into where we're going. And so Jesus didn't leave them without a clear understanding of semiotics here. He gives them a sign. And Jesus replied to them, I'm going to stop right there for right now, but I'm going to give you just to whet your appetite. Some of the things we want to look at is that when we get into the unfolding of Matthew 24 and what's actually going on, who he's talking to, we're going to look at some personal pronouns, such as in verse 9. Jesus says to them, then they will hand you personal pronoun." Or to be persecuted. So the personal pronoun is speaking not of future people, but of those that he's talking to. They will deliver you to be persecuted. Look at that. That's a personal pronoun here. Um, you, personal pronoun, will be hated by all nations because of my name. Then many will fall away, betray one another, hate one another. Many false prophets will rise up and deceive many because lawlessness will multiply. The love of many will grow cold. But the good news of the kingdom will be proclaimed into all the world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Then the end will come. The end of what? Heavens and earth. The end of what? The temple that existed. The, what, and everything the temple entails or represents comes to an end after the gospel is preached. Let me, ladies and gentlemen, when he says the gospel will be preached as a testimony to all nations, the word world here in the Greek means Roman Empire. It means the known world, and the gospel was preached in a 40-year period uh, to the existing world and brought an end to the Old Covenant, full end to the Old Covenant age. And when you, personal pronoun, he's talking to his disciples, see the abomination of desolation spoken by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place. Verse 20, pray your escape, personal pronoun. Are you getting where I'm going here? Over and over and over again, we're seeing the personal pronoun of who Jesus is identifying and who Jesus is talking to. And then we finally get over around verse uh, 29 and verse 30 that the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. And we're going to get into this, pick back up on this probably tomorrow, guys. Thank you for tuning in. If you will, share this on your wall. Um, invite If you know somebody who needs to hear it, invite somebody to listen to this because there was definitely some, um, I felt the fire of God backing me as I, as I declared this message today. So um, I appreciate you sharing. I'm going to pick back up on this. We're going to break uh, Matthew 24 open more and more as we begin to unfold Matthew 24, the sign of the kingdom. And by the way, I recommend a book on this. Go to Amazon. 
and type in the sign of the kingdom. It's the best book on Matthew chapter 24 that's ever been written as far as I'm aware. It'll help you to bless you. And it'll help unfold this and give you great clarity. And it's written where, where a, a layman can understand it. It's written in a way that you can perceive it, you can understand it. Um, it's beautifully articulated. Um, the Sign of the Kingdom, George E. Curry. Phenomenal book on this whole entire, this whole entire, um, um, whole entire topic. And if you want to read a, a big book, you can always read Days of read Days of Vengeance by David Chilton. It's about 800 pages. Um, you can always read that one. That's a great one. Uh, Kenneth Gentry wrote one called Before Jerusalem Fell. That's a great one because it was his doctoral thesis in dating the book of Revelation, giving it a, a pre-80-70. Which, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, N.T. Wright, I was listening to a little bit of him the other night, and N.T. Wright as well is arguing at this present moment for an early date of the Revelation. So even N.T. Wright is holding and, and contending for Revelation, the book of Revelation, not written in 95, 96, 97 A.D., but rather written around 64, 65 A.D., 66 A.D. So... The proof's in the pudding. I love you guys. We're going to pick back up on this, and we're going to deal with the judgment of the nations. And it, this is so important because when we think judgment on nations, we think, oh, God, God, well, he wants us to all be judged and die. No, no, no. It's because of the injustices in the earth that the Lord judges today to right the wrong and to bring people into a place all of ultimate peace and prosperity. So I bless you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's been a blessing to you. Pray about being a monthly partner with us or a one-time one time, um, a gift. It blesses us. It helps us continue to do this. And it takes a lot of pressure off of us so we can continue in this work. Which, by the way, I'm now in the process of getting my source material um, to earn my doctrine in theology. Um, I've got to get a lot of the books that I'm having to read. Um, I even got an Amazon, I've even got, created an Amazon list, so I'm not sure how to work it yet. But I, I'm excited about the journey. God bless you. God be with you. God keep you. Christ in you. Christ before you. Christ for you. Christ in you. In Jesus' name. Amen.